Good, Good morning, morning, everybody. everybody. He is risen. He's, He's risen, risen indeed. indeed. He is risen indeed. Well, happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday, Westbrook family. Uh, we so wish that the Sands family could be with all of the other families of Westbrook, but here we are providentially hindered from doing so. However, we can uh, worship in spirit and uh, we will worship in truth this morning um, together, uh, celebrating the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we have prayed much for you all during this time. We trust in faith that the Lord can and will use this time uh, together for our edification and uh, and growth in our relationships with one another and uh, in the Lord. Hey, I just wanted to read a quick scripture to get us going this morning uh, to just think about uh, the reality of our lives in Jesus Christ. Uh, that is the gospel, right? Uh, in Romans chapter 3, Paul writes, beginning in verse 21, he says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. Would you pray with me this morning? We've got some great songs that we're going to sing. Um, and uh, Pastor John has uh, a great uh, a word for us this morning on the resurrection of Jesus um, and what that means. Um, and I'd also ask you to stick around at the end. There's a very special announcement from one of our elders, Mark Whiting, and then uh, a message from Pastor John and Tisa as well. And one last thing. Can I just encourage you? Take a picture. We want to see what Sunday mornings are looking like for you uh, uh, as we are gathering in this uh, new temporary, it's important we say that, temporary way. As we know, we are confident that we will come together uh, again. But take a picture. If you're comfortable, share it on social media or send it to the office. Um, we just want to know. We want to see. We want to celebrate what God is doing in your families. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this wonderful divine reality that we have through faith in Jesus Christ that we've been made right with you. Would you warm our hearts to the gospel this morning? Would you potentially, Lord, we know that you can do this, use this message, maybe for someone who doesn't know your son, doesn't know you, hasn't been made right with you through faith in Jesus, Lord. We trust you, we love you, and we just thank you for Jesus Christ and for all that he accomplished on our behalf, Lord. So would you use this message this morning? Would you use this time that we gather in spirit to grow each one of us in our relationships with one another and with you, Lord? We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, by the power of the spirit, the one that rose him from the dead, that lives inside of us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Westbrook Church. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I want to just remind us that we should not worry that Westbrook Church right now is empty on Easter morning because the tomb was also empty. Amen. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Sunday. I so wish that we could be together, that I could hear your voices singing praise to Jesus on this day when we celebrate his rising from the dead. Um, and, and I look forward to the day when we can be together worshiping as a church again. But I pray this morning that your hearts and your homes are filled with worship um, and that you're, you're singing just as loud as you would if you were in church. So would you please sing with me? Oh, praise the name. The 
us our guidance in the dwell again with us. Today's scripture is going to be John chapter 20, the empty tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came alongside him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord! And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thank you. Westbrook Church on Resurrection Sunday. What a glorious thing it is to worship the risen Lord Jesus. You know that the most simple and profound confession of the Christian church is simply Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that is the confession of Christians all through history, all over the world. And you know, that first became a real reality in my life in 1975. I was 18 years old and it was the wonders of the resurrection that really gripped my heart and my mind. And to this day, that's what keeps me. I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the answers in this book. But I believe that Christ died for my sins and rose again from the dead. And that's what keeps me, and I pray that's what keeps you too. And I'm going to share this morning from John chapter 20. Thank you, Lori, for having read it. The amazing account of the resurrection, you know, it's in every gospel and then all through the book of Acts, the apostles preach the crucified and risen Christ. And that's the message of the Christian church. It's the most powerful message in the world that Christ was crucified for sinners and has risen from the dead. And that simple message comes with the power of God for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. John chapter 20 begins with Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb early on that first Easter resurrection morning. Mary Magdalene. She was a woman with a terrible past, a terrible reputation, and yet Christ had loved her like no one else had loved her with a redeeming love. And she comes on that morning looking for the body of Christ. She's going to get more than she bargained for. Let me tell you, those who seek Christ with all their hearts find him and they always get more than they bargain for. Well, she came. The stone had been removed, chapter 20, verse 1. She came running and told Simon, Peter, and John, the other disciple, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. I don't know where they've put him. So Peter and John run to the tomb. They look in, and they see the tomb empty, just the burial clothes there. But let's focus on Mary for a few moments. The disciples go back to their homes, but Mary stands outside the tomb crying. And as she weeps, she looks inside and she sees two angels dressed in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. Now, have you ever seen two angels? Shouldn't that have satisfied Mary? What an amazing experience! I didn't see Jesus, but I saw two angels. Certainly that's enough to satisfy my curiosity and to thrill my mind and to give me some new Christian or religious experience. When you're looking for Christ, nothing else will satisfy. And when you've found Christ, nothing else is needed. Mary wasn't satisfied with two angels. She wouldn't have been satisfied with a hundred angels. And if you came to church on a Sunday morning and saw two angels, but the Bible wasn't opened and Christ wasn't offered you from the scriptures, you would not be all the better because of that. Where have they taken Jesus? They say to her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they've put him. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. It was early in the morning, still dark. She'd been crying. Maybe that's why she didn't realize. 
thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Where have they carried him and put him? I will get him. Jesus says to her, Mary. Oh, we have to stop there a moment. You know, she'd been a woman with a reputation. Many men had said things to her. Hey, woman, come here. Maybe they'd whistled after her. But Jesus knew her name and called her by her name in a way I would imagine nobody else ever had. With love, with value, knowing that she's made in the image of God, with redemptive grace, He called her name like no one else ever did. He calls your name like no one else ever does. He knows you. He knows your past. He knows your sins. He knows you're made in the image of God and that you are of profound eternal value. And He wants to redeem you even as He redeemed Mary. And it was when He said, Mary, the way only Jesus could that she realized it was him. Rabboni, my teacher, she says. And she grabs him and Jesus says, no, don't grab me. I'm going to the Father. Instead, go and tell my brothers. Let's just stop there. My brothers. The disciples had all denied him and all deserted him. He could have said, we would have said, go and tell those miserable scoundrels, those failures that I'm coming for them, or I'm finished with them. But that's not what he says. Go and tell my brothers. Look at the abounding grace of the risen Lord. Go and tell my brothers that I'm going back to my Father, to my God. What does he say? Go and tell them I'm returning to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. He's still our God, even though we've denied him? And we fail? The covenant faithfulness of God is everlasting. The risen Lord says to Mary Magdalene, Go and tell my brothers that my Father is still their Father. And God is still their God. So Mary goes and tells them. We get to verse 19 and it's now the evening of that first day. Look at the scene. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. That is a remarkably pathetic scene. This is the first church. These are the ones who had spent three years with Jesus. These are the starting eleven. These are the first teamers. These are the crack troops. And what are they doing? The doors are locked and they're afraid. John and Mark have already seen an empty tomb. Mary has already told them, I've seen the Lord. The Old Testament scriptures pointed so many times to the resurrection. Jesus had promised his resurrection so many times, and yet where are they? They're behind locked doors. Well, what's Jesus going to do about that? Jesus came and stood among them. He comes to them. And what's he going to do? Is he going to scold them? We would almost expect that, wouldn't we? If we didn't know Jesus and his character and his heart for redeeming us, we would almost expect anyone else to come and say, you miserable disciples, I gave you everything. I taught you. I fed you. And here you are behind locked doors. You don't believe anything. I'm giving up on you. I'm going to find other disciples. Or I'm not even going to redeem this planet. He doesn't say that. He comes and he says, Peace be with you. And after that, he shows them his hands and his side. And then he says, Peace be with you again. Let me ask you this question. How can God come with a message of peace to failed disciples? I need to know that. Because I identify with these disciples. It has to do with those hands and that side. Those hands on that side had just spilled blood on a cross, atoning blood for the sins of the world, establishing a covenant of redemption through the blood of Christ. Jesus came to them and said, Peace be with you, because he had spilled his blood for their sins. 
You see, if I were to give you a sermon today about my faithfulness as a disciple, it would be a very short sermon, maybe 30 seconds at the best. What's important here is Jesus' faithfulness as a Savior. Why didn't he give up on these disciples? Because he had promised his Father. Father, if you give anyone to me, I will never drive them away, and I will not lose one of all that you give to me, but I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus didn't give up on these disciples, not because they were wonderful, not because they were amazing, but because he promised his Father he wouldn't. And if that's true for them, it's true for you. Believe that with me today. Maybe you're a brand new Christian, maybe you're not a Christian yet, maybe you've been a Christian for decades, but you and I need to hear that glorious truth. And then he said to them, I'm sending you. Now, think about that. We would have imagined him saying, okay, peace be with you, but I can't send you anymore. Uh, You're going to be relegated now. You're going to be bench warmers from now on. You're not the starting 11 anymore. I can't trust you. For all I know, you'll give up on me again and you'll quit. I'm sending you. I've not given up on my purpose for you. You are my missionaries in this world. Oh, I need to know that word. Let me tell you, I have failed Christ many times in my life, but he's never failed me. And he'll never fail you. Believe that this resurrection morning. Believe it with all your heart. I'm sending you. I've not given up on you. You're still my starting lineup. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This, of course, was fulfilled fully at Pentecost. But there's another time in the Bible when God breathes on something. Remember God breathing on Adam and he gives him life at creation, now at new creation. Same thing is happening. It's a new creation now. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit, and if you forgive anyone his sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. In other words, I'm commissioning you with the gospel, with the message of forgiveness. You failures, you failures now have the message of forgiveness. You've experienced it for yourselves. You know it like no one else knows. Now go tell others. You know, the message we have for the world is not, look at us, aren't we amazing? We're impeccable followers of Christ. We are ever loyal to Jesus. That's not our message, because it's not true. Our message for the world is, we have discovered the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, and we offer this message to you with authority that says, If you receive him and believe on him, we have authority in the name of the gospel, in the name of God, to declare your sins forgiven. The authority is not in us. It wasn't in those disciples. It was in the gospel and the message they had. Well, verse 24, Thomas wasn't there that morning. In verse 24, we meet Thomas. I'm so glad that Thomas wasn't there. Because the little story about Thomas is so helpful for you and for me. By the way, you never know what you're going to miss when you miss church. Maybe Thomas was washing the car that morning, or maybe he was doing his laundry or sleeping in, whatever. But point being, he missed a great meeting. You never know what you're going to miss. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not there. So the other disciples told him, Not, Thomas, you miserable rat, you weren't at church today. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, we have seen the Lord. That was their message to Thomas. And Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I am thankful for Thomas. By the way, Thomas ended up taking the gospel to South India. South India. There are Christians today in South India that trace their roots back to this doubting disciple. And Thomas said, I have to see it. In other words, Thomas is saying this, the Christ of history and the Christ of faith must combine for me. I don't want some ghost Jesus, some ethereal, some some wispy idea that I can feel good about. I have to see Christ. I need to know the history of this. This is a history book, friends. 
a week later, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, and though the doors were locked, oh, oh my goodness, we haven't learned much in a week, have we? I understand this. I can be full of faith on Monday and empty on Tuesday. I need to seek Jesus every day. I can be trusting God for great things on Wednesday, and by Thursday I'm all over the place again. And that's what's happening here. Jesus comes and stands among them. And what does he say again? Verse 26. He doesn't say, you're locked again? You miserable guys! I'm not breathing on you anymore. I'm taking it back. He doesn't say that. Again, he says, peace be with you. We have peace with God through his blood, friends. It's an eternal covenant that cannot and will not be violated because it's between Jesus and his Father and we're the beneficiaries of it. He's not giving up on these guys. He's not giving up on you. He's not giving up on his church. He's not giving up on Westbrook. He never will. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe, Thomas. Thomas must have thought, well, I said that in private a week ago, but he's here repeating exactly what I said. He was here. He heard me. And Thomas says, my Lord, oh my God. That confession of faith in Christ, as I said a moment ago, took Thomas to India. While all the other apostles went west to Europe, Thomas went east to India and lived and died there for Christ. My Lord and that's interesting that Jesus allowed Thomas to ascribe to him that ultimate adoration. My Lord and my God. If Jesus was only a good man, only a good man, he would have said to Thomas, Don't say that, Thomas. That's blasphemy. Or if Jesus was a bad man, he would have said, That's nice to hear that, Thomas. That's great. I got you fooled. But Jesus received the worship of Thomas. But look at verse 29. Moms, dads, open your Bibles and look at verse 29. Show it to your children right now because this verse, verse 29, is, is for you and for me. Listen to what Jesus says. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. That verse talks about those who have seen Jesus and believed. That's up until that moment, and then Jesus looks into the future of Christianity, right down to 2020, right down to today, and says, blessed are those who have not seen me, but who have believed. That's every Christian. The millions and millions and millions and millions of Christians from that moment on who have not seen, but have believed. Thomas and friends saw and believed. We have heard and believed. We've heard a message and believed. And look what Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. You see, we're tempted to think, it must have been nice for those guys, they saw. Obviously they're in a different category than us. Obviously we're kind of in category B because we've only heard. Jesus does not say that. Jesus says those who haven't seen by implication, those who have heard the message of the gospel and have believed the gospel are blessed, equally blessed with the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the commission of Jesus to go and tell. We are as blessed as they were. Will you believe that with me today? We're one body with them. You know, Erasmus, a 16th century Dutch thinker said these words, the Bible, that's this book, the Bible will give you Jesus Christ in an intimacy more real than if he were stood before your eyes. In other words, to have this book, read it with the help of the Holy Spirit, see Christ in it, gives you the knowledge of Christ as surely as if you were a disciple with him in that upper room, in that locked room that night. What grace our Savior has. 
if he had grace for them, he's got all the grace in the world for you. His grace is not like a little puddle. It's not even like this beautiful lake behind me. It's a river. It is unending, and you and I will never exhaust it. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Some are in the other Gospels. Some are not in the Bible, but Jesus did many other wonderful things. But the miracles in the Bible are the authentic sign miracles that are, that are there to bring us to faith in Jesus Christ. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That word believe is found 98 times in John's Gospel. What's the response to the gospel? Well, it's really profound and it's simple. Believe it. Believe it. And when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, crucified for us and risen, the Bible teaches that God absolves us, delivers us from sin, justifies us before Him, and grants us the gift of eternal life, and we are brought into His kingdom, transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light kingdom of the Son in whom he loves. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thirty-six times in John's Gospel we find that word life. Do you know, friends, so many don't have a lifestyle, they have a death style. We're marching toward death. But through the Gospel we have new life in Christ. I've experienced that. I'm not in heaven yet. I'm not a perfect Christian by a thousand miles, but I have a perfect Savior. It's about His grace and His faithfulness, and I am amazed how in John chapter 20, the risen Jesus comes abounding in grace for His church, for you, and for me. For me. Will you apply the gospel to your own life this Easter? You know, if we were in a gathered congregation, I, I could look right at you right now, but I can't. But the Holy Spirit can touch your heart. Will you apply this gospel to your heart? Will you believe the gospel afresh today? Maybe you've been a Christian longer than half a century. I don't know, but apply the You know what it's like to fail. You know what it's like to be like these disciples and deny Christ but those wounds speak an eternal word of pardon and forgiveness they speak of a covenant that God will never ever go back on so go and live for Jesus here's where I want to finish this morning we have a world that needs Christ oh don't we have a world that needs Christ and the most important thing on earth today is not this virus it is the gospel. God is not biting his nails and pacing the floor this morning saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with earth. He knows what he's going to do. He's going to spread the gospel through this planet to every tribe and tongue and nation. Friends, let's tell our neighbors about the risen Christ. That commission that Jesus gave to his disciples, I'm sending you. Is a commission not just for them, it's for every Christian who's heard and who believes. Oh, it's been such a joy to meet with you today, Easter. I prefer to call it Resurrection Day. It's such a joy to meet with you today on Resurrection Day. I can't wait until we're together again as a church and we break bread together and we sing together and we embrace one another. That day will come. But in the meantime, let us love one another and love our neighbors in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Will you say this with me? I'm going to say this basic creed of the Christian church. He is risen. And would you respond right where you are by saying he is risen indeed. Let's say these words together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Grace and peace to you in abundance today. Amen. Thank you, John, for that great message. A, a great message of hope and celebration for us at Easter time. Didn't start that way, though, did it? Consider for a moment, if you will, how the disciples and the women would have handled that weekend.
Friday and Saturday would have been dark, depressing days where they felt completely defeated. Uh, Sunday morning, the women would have gotten up early in the dark to go to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus, fully expecting the tomb to be closed, the body of Jesus to be there for him to still be dead. It didn't turn out that way, did it? Um, they got there, the tomb was open, the body of Jesus was gone. There was confusion, but I think there was some hope. I think there may have been some recollection of maybe um, I'm remembering some of the words that Jesus said. And then they found Jesus and they saw Jesus and it changed them. It changed them. The, dis the disciples came and they saw the same thing, the empty tomb and the risen Christ, just as they, as they had been told that they would. They changed that day. They changed from weak and scared and hiding from the Jews to brave and vocal followers of Christ who shared the message of Jesus everywhere that they could. Um, why, what made them change that day? The empty tomb, the risen Christ, and the Christ that had come to them. And that's our prayer for you today, that you will see and know and believe that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has risen and has risen indeed, and that he's come to live with us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for Easter. We thank you, God, that, that you came incarnate and that you died a terrible death, God, for us. That Jesus died on that cross for each person that's listening to this today, Father. I pray that they will understand it. I pray that they will understand the empty tomb and the risen Christ. And they will understand what that means for them and that, that we all can be brave and vocal followers of Christ because of the fact that he's risen today. Thank you for that. We pray in his name, amen. I have one other thing to share with you today. <clears throat> it's a, a bit of good news and it relates to our senior pastor, John Gillespie, who just heard. Let me, let me give you some background because everybody might not know everything but about him. Um, he served as a pastor in England for 25 years. Um, a very faithful follower over there. Um, in 2012, he decided for a number of reasons that it was time to come back to the stage where he grew up, and he moved to Overland Park so he could be close to his father, who was aging, and he wanted to make sure he spent the last few years of, of his father's life with him. When he came here, he was trying to understand the community and the w different ways of the United States and what have you. And one day, he found himself at Ace Hardware and actually asked an Ace Hardware employee, do you know of any good churches, any good gospel churches? Not a fancy American one, and you can hear John even asking it just in that way. And for whatever reason, this employee from Ace Hardware pointed him to Westbrook. We don't know who that Ace Hardware employee was. We've never heard. My personal belief is that God planted an angel there and used that angel to point John directly to Westbrook. John Atisa came here, plugged in right away, got involved in care groups, John got to teach occasionally, got to help support the staff, um, served all, all over the place here while they were maintaining their, their uh, full-time gig with Global Training Network. 2018, our church went through some changes and John stepped in and said, I'll, I'm willing to help in any way that I can. And, and he did a great job and, and we asked him to be our interim pastor. Within a year, uh, we took off that interim uh, tag and made him our permanent senior pastor. And John and Tisa agreed that they would do that, and they put a target date, an end date on that of 2022. On their own, John and Tisa began to pray and began to ask God what his plan was for them. And they have come to us, to the elders and to the body, and say, we want to stay here at Westbrook as long as God deems it appropriate. And so they've taken off that date of 2022. They're going to be here as long as God calls them to be part of our body. And we're excited about that. We're excited that they're going to be here for a, a longer period of time. So great news. I thought you'd all love to hear that today. Um, reach out to John and Tisa and welcome them to a, a more permanent um, role with us. And just praise God that they're here. Thank you. Well, we've had a wonderful Resurrection Day service together as a church. And Tisa and I now greet you from our home. And... You've heard what Mark said about our happy desire to remain with you for the sake of the gospel for as long as the Lord would have us. 
when we got married in uh, 1982, inscribed on the inside of my wedding ring was this verse. It's our life verse as a couple, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for, for Christ's sake. Well, that inscription has long, long worn off my ring, but it hasn't worn off our hearts, and it hasn't worn off our lives, and it's the, it's the life verse of our marriage. Uh, by the way, I encourage you to have such a life verse in your life and situation, that we are here not to offer ourselves or to preach ourselves, but just to offer Christ and simply our servants of, ourselves as servants of Christ for your sake, and for the sake of the gospel, and we are very, very honored to follow Jesus with you and to uh, serve as pastor and wife at Westbrook and to serve with the incredible other staff and elders and servants and all of you. Uh, together we might serve the purpose of Jesus in our generation. And our only calling is to love you and speak the truth from this book to you and to pray with you and to pray for you. About 10 years ago, Tisa and I uh, prayerfully decided on five life values, non-negotiables that we wanted true in our lives when we were 60 years old and now we're in our 60s and these were the five things and we can fulfill all these at Westbrook in our lives. Number one, we wanted to be vitally involved in world missions and Westbrook is a mission-minded church and as our lives also extend into some mission travel, uh, Westbrook extends to us the freedom to continue to do that. Number two, we want to be vitally involved in seeing the next generation of leaders being raised up. And uh, I can't rejoice in anything more than giving part of my life to Chad and Ricky and other elders and young men and young women, and who knows who's going to come through Westbrook Church. Number three, that we would be vitally involved in the life of a local church because we believe the local church is God's answer for the world through the gospel and uh, what a wonderful local church Westbrook is. Number four, that we would be vitally involved in the lives of our children and grandchildren. Eighteen grandchildren we now have and we can be involved from Westbrook. Uh, we can be totally involved in their lives. Most of our kids are scattered to the world, many of them serving Jesus and to see grandma and grandpa serving Jesus will do them good. And number five, we would, whatever we did, we wanted to do it together. And we are, we are a team, a complete team. So um, thank you for having us. We're humbled. We're blessed um, beyond what we deserve. And so we are your servants for Christ's sake and for the gospel. We really look forward to continuing to... Look to Jesus as the head of the church and let him lead and guide the church. And um, the main way to do that is through prayer. And we want to continue to see the church grow in prayer. We're thankful for all the, the prayer warriors that are here. And we want to continue to grow in those things, grow in prayer as a church, our church prayer meetings. Um, and things like the National Day of Prayer, praying for our country, for our, um, for our neighborhoods, for our prodigals, for the lost around us, for revival, for this world, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that we would be, that Lord would be uh, using us to disciple new believers and to welcome them into our small groups and all these sorts of things. Um, those are some of the things that are really on my heart. And so we just continue to look forward to serving the Lord with you together. We love Westbrook. We're so thankful for the way you embraced us when we first moved here, and uh, we love you all. Just to finish, and by the way, Jefferson's here too, um, to remember the words of David Brainerd, the incredible words, may the Lord use us, Westbrook, in a way totally disproportionate to who we are. We're not big, we're not amazing in the world's eyes, but we are beloved of God. And as we consecrate ourselves to him, may the Lord use us all together for his glory and for the good of many in a way totally dis disproportionate to who we are. So grace and peace. Have a wonderful rest of this resurrection day. Rejoice in our risen Savior. 
And uh, let's go live for Christ and see him do great things together. Grace and peace. Bye-bye.